The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Waste from Rented Households and the Law webinar. My name is Barry Shepherd, and I am chair of the London and Southern Counties CIWM Regional Centre, and I'll also be your chair for today's webinar. This is a joint webinar between the London and Southern Counties and the North West Centres. Just a couple of housekeeping things first. I would like to point out that although your microphones are muted, you are still able to ask questions by typing these into the question box on the bottom of the grey dashboard on your screen. I would encourage you to do this at any point throughout the webinar. Your questions are not public, they can only be seen by the organisers. If you lose your grey dashboard at any point, there is a small orange arrow at the top left corner of the dashboard that will show or hide it. If you manage to minimise or lose your webinar presentation screen, click on the blue flower on your taskbar at the bottom of the monitor and that should make it reappear. This session is being recorded and a link to this will be shared with you via email tomorrow. So don't worry about taking lots of notes as you'll be able to revisit the recording of the slides as well as hear the presentation at your leisure. Audience questions will be asked at the end of each panelist's presentation. This will give you a chance to type them into the question box as you think of them. We do ask that you submit type questions throughout rather than waiting to the end so that we can group the questions into relevant topics and avoid duplication. We will endeavour to answer as many questions as time allows, but may not be able to get through them all depending on how many are asked. Throughout the webinar, you will be asked for your opinions in the form of questions and multiple choice polls. When a question comes up on your screen, you will have approximately 30 to 40 seconds to tick the answer that you want to make and then click submit. At the end of the webinar, a very brief multiple choice survey will also pop up when you log out. Please take a couple of minutes to let us know what you think. What you think. Your views are very important to us and will help us to improve things for future webinars. We have a number of panellists presenting for you today. Um, these panellists are Jenny Watts, an environmental solicitor from uh, Watts Legal, Linda Brown from Newham Council, uh, who is um, who's going to talk about enforcement from rented households and the law, and Katharina Pack from Ealing Council. We'll run through the presentations um, during the webinar and you should be able to see on your screen there um, pictures of the presenters and a picture of myself as well. Also Beverly Simonson who is the question host. Beverly will collate and ask questions as they come through. I'd just like to set the scene a bit really for um, what uh, we're going to be talking about today before I move on to the first presenter. We're going to be talking around waste from rented households and what the law says. Poor waste management practices in the domestic rented sector is commonly identified as having a negative impact on recycling performance as well as causing significant street scene issues such as small scale dumping. This in turn has significant cost and resourcing implications for local authorities at a time of sustained financial pressures on budgets. This webinar, which as I mentioned earlier is jointly delivered by London and Southern Counties and North West Centres, is intended to build upon the Guide to Improving Waste Management in the Rental Sector, which was published in 2017 by Resource London and the London Environmental Directors Network. This guide is intended to identify opportunities for improving waste management practices within the capital's domestic rental sector. Much of the focus of the report is on the relevant enforcement and legislation powers officers can use to better control waste and increase recycling. And this webinar is intended to provide a deeper understanding of the use of legislation to help empower local authorities to control waste, increase recycling and improve the street system. So without more ado, I'd like to hand over to the first presenter, um, Jenny Watts, who is an environmental solicitor from Watts Legal. Thank you very much. Over to you, Jenny. 
thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me well and hello to you all. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jenny Watts. I'm from Watts Legal. I specialise in environmental crime with a specific focus on waste related um, enforcement uh, with a background of uh, industry practice before I converted to the dark side of the law. I have um, quite a depth of understanding of waste related matters. I'm also a Chartered Waste Manager, a trustee of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management and a Northwest Centre Councillor. For today's presentation, um, I wanted to discuss the involvement that What's Legal had with Unomia, who were engaged by Lednet and Resource London to look at different provisions for managing the improvement of waste management in the domestic rented sector. Essentially, Unomia instructed What's Legal to provide legal opinion opinion about what enforcement tools and mechanisms are available um, for local authority enforcement officers in tackling the issue of poor recycling and contamination. So we have a poll for you. Which is about poor recycling and contamination being a problem. So you can select whether it is for you or not, or if you're not sure or perhaps not directly involved with this particular issue. Okay, so overwhelmingly 97% of you have identified that it is a real issue in your neighbourhoods. So, What's Legal has um, a client, which is Keep Britain Tidy, we're a legal associate to Keep Britain Tidy, which has predominantly local authority membership. So we deliver all the enforcement training. And what we found, much like our poll today, is that a lot of local authorities have issues around poor recycling and contamination um, at the curbside. So what we've been able to do with um, with Unomia and our research around the use of controlled waste regulations 2012. This is up as versus section 46 of the Environmental Protection Act which has been traditionally used to tackle um, poor performance at the curbside. So what we wanted to investigate whether controlled waste regulations would be an appropriate mechanism and a tool available to enforcement officers to tackle this as an issue. Now, as many of you may already be aware, Section 46 is an ability for local authority officers to ensure that householders effectively put out the waste for collection on specified days, potentially at specified times, and the different recyclates that can go into the different receptacles. Now this can be done by way of a section 46 notice. What most authorities tend to do is to put out some literature about what that particular authority expects from its householders in terms of um, complying with the section 46 notice as opposed to actually formally issuing section 46 notices. The reason for that being that section 46 notice can attract an appeal and it wouldn't be wise to serve notices on um, householders that are essentially complying. What Eric Pickles did back in 2015 was to bring about the Deregulation Act which decriminalised section 46 which was historically a criminal offence not to comply with the requirements that the local authority would have specified. As a consequence, the, the revised Section 46 procedure is now a criminal, um, is not a criminal standard, but a balance of probabilities standard. So it's a civil route to enforcement. What the procedure now requires 
is, is quite a long-winded, drawn-out process that local authority officers need to embark upon if they want to use this as a tool to secure compliance. So let's run through what it entails. First and foremost, a written warning needs to be issued. The person has failed without reasonable excuse to comply with the requirement and has caused or is likely to cause a nuisance or be detrimental to any amenities of the locality. So what the written warning needs to have specified in it is the nature of the failure, i.e. not putting the right waste in the right place, the impact of the failure, on how that will impact on contamination of the in, entirety of the load and the period in which to comply which would perhaps be by the next collection round and the consequences of non-conformance so how this procedure will then follow on um, to issue a notice of intent so that's your notice of intent to issue a fixed penalty notice but there are a series of steps that need to be complied with from a local authority perspective before you can actually get to the issue of a penalty. So essentially, you need to issue the notice of intent to afford the householder to make representations. And those representations need to be submitted to the local authority within 28 days. Essentially, you can't take any further action for that 28 day period to allow enough opportunity for those representations to be forthcoming and that might be legitimate reasons as to why that particular householder cannot comply with the requirements of the local authority in terms of their section 46. Once those representations are received, then the authority is duty bound to consider them. And if they do not agree that the representations are genuine um, or that there can't be a route to resolving the issue, then a final notice needs to be served. Once that final notice is served and there continues to be non-compliance, then a fixed penalty notice can be issued for £60 or a lesser amount if, if that authority has it by way of policy that a reduction could be offered and payment within 28 days of the £60 or whatever the prescribed amount is. Now there is a right to appeal which essentially suspends the fixed penalty notice so you will have this period of time which can be significant ranging from a matter of weeks to months before compliance can be secured. If the appeal is heard by the court and the court upholds, upholds the appeal, then the householder will be given 28 days to make payment. Now that payment is recoverable as a summary debt, so it's through the civil courts that you would pursue the householder for payment. One of the advantages of using this route is that it is a balance of probabilities test. So therefore, it could be on any occupier of the household the balance being that it is more than likely that they will produce waste and at some point will have put that waste out for collection so that is an advantage because when it was the criminal procedure you had to ensure that your evidence was against the actual person that had committed the offender so that's one advantage the other advantage is that after you've gone through what is quite a long drawn out process and you come out the other end and you're fixed penalty is upheld, you can essentially issue a fixed penalty as many times as you like within the 12 month period following the fixed penalty being upheld. So that can be quite effective because you could basically put a fixed penalty to that household every week that they don't comply and that would soon tot up. That said, the advantages probably don't um, outweigh the the procedure and from on the ground experience we know that a lot of um, authorities shy away from this line of enforcement given its shortcomings in terms of the time taken to secure compliance so we looked at the controlled waste regulations 2012 most of you will be familiar with these as they bring about the charging mechanism that you can impose for perhaps a green waste collection. 
There are 17 exceptions uh, to the free of charge obligation, which you do have by virtue of Section 45 of the Environmental Protection Act to collect um, household waste free of charge. Uh, 10 of those are collection only charges and seven of those are collection and disposal charges. Now what the Section 46 11 of the Environmental Protection Act does allow you to do is not to collect household waste if a householder has been in breach of the Section 46 requirement. Now, whilst that is available to you, it is probably not desirable to not collect the household waste because there could be all kinds of problems associated with that, accumulations on the curbside and so on. But what controlled waste regulations allows you to do under schedule one paragraph four is allow you to issue a section 46 notice and that is a prerequisite you do need to issue the notice specifying what your requirements are and if that householder fails to comply with the notice served upon them um, then you can um, make a collection charge only so this would enable you to bypass the very long-winded section 46 procedure and go straight in with the notice non-compliance follows and then a charge is levied now that charge can entail the administration of a range of the logistics to go and pick up the contaminated recycling uh, which would involve a separate crew and potentially a separate vehicle now, they are not supposed to be punitive charges, but the actual cost to the authority of having to deal with the problem um, that you're trying to abate. So it's not seen as, as a pot of gold or a revenue generating exercise, um, but it could be used as a very effective way of securing compliance a lot quicker than what the Section 46 procedure allows. So question for the audience. How do you tackle the presentation of waste issues? So some of you may be still using the Section 46 route as it has been decriminalised. You may well have embarked upon the use of the Controlled Waste Regulations 2012 charge. Section 87 is quite common uh, for using the littering offence uh, for perhaps side waste. And Section 33, especially with the introduction of the fixed penalty fly tipping um, or there may be any other way or a combination of the above depending on what the actual issue is that you're dealing with so we'll wait for the poll to progress and we found that most are using the section 46 procedure quite interestingly nobody's used the control waste regulations and hence uh, part of the, the research that we conducted uh, with uh, Unomia and providing legal opinion was very much around whether this could be used in the alternative. Nobody's using littering, which is, is good, and nobody's, uh, well, there's a few using section 33 for fly tipping and then a combination of the above depending on the issue. So, when we look at the using the littering uh, which nobody seems to be uh, utilizing as an enforcement tool the littering offense section 87 the environmental protection act says that it's an offense to throw down drop or otherwise deposit litter and leave it now some authorities would use this for potentially side waste because it does fit the definition as does fly tipping for knowingly causing or knowingly permitting waste to be deposited on land without the benefit of an environmental permit, usually again for side waste. What we would um, or what we have also encountered is the use of community protection notices by virtue of the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act, which came into force in 2014. Now, this is a three point test. Um, where you have to demonstrate as an authority that the behaviour is having a detrimental effect on the quality of life of those in the locality. And that's an objective test. Be persistent or continuing in nature and be unreasonable. So whilst on the face of it, uh, littering 
fly tipping, community protection notice may seem appropriate, it would be very much our advice that if those uh, legal mechanisms uh, were used as enforcement tools, it would be contrary to the, the policy of government to decriminalise any behaviour associated with the presentation of household waste, whether that be contamination um, or um, side waste or any other issues, um, because essentially you would then be criminalising something that has been decriminalised. Um, so we would um, be very um, cautionary about using any of the criminal mechanisms for tackling household related waste. In terms of any notices that you are going to issue, it's important that they are prescriptive enough so that the householder understands what their requirements are, hence why there is the prerequisite to issue the written warning first and foremost and try and secure behaviour through effective dialogue and ensuring that there is full understanding. It needs to also not be too restrictive just in case the householder or the, the offender um, can provide alternatives to what the authority may deem as appropriate and the authority Authority would be duty bound to explore that with the perpetrator. So, top of the top of the post would always be dialogue is essential. Try and sort out the issue by having effective engagement. And across the board, for any enforcement activity that you do undertake, it is absolutely imperative to keep at the forefront of your mind the legislative and regulatory reform act 2006 which enshrines the principles of enforcement which are within the regulators code and that is to be proportionate it's not using a sledgehammer to crack a nut it's about outcome focused regulation what you want to achieve and how how you're going to achieve it. It's about being targeted. We all have uh, what uh, Keeper entirely referred to as grot spots in our areas. These are areas that need your regulatory effort to bring about um, compliance and clean up our neighbourhoods. You need to be transparent because if you're undertaking duties as a local authority, you are acting of a public body so you need to have a full audit trail be consistent with your approach and ultimately be accountable for any enforcement action that you take so we advocate that your policy should be built around um, the pyramid of campaigning and education at the top make sure your community are alive to what your expectations are and what needs to be done in, to ensure compliance with the law and use enforcement options and um, as a last resort to bring about um, what are, are the minority of people that will not comply as a last point we found uh, through the various local authorities we engage with around the country that utilising operatives on the front line uh, can be a very effective measure to assist your enforcement activity. They can essentially be um, effective eyes and ears on the ground assisting your uh, regulatory enforcement teams. So ultimately it would be very interesting to take your feedback on whether you think the use of controlled waste regulations would be an effective remedy to tackle um, contamination at the curbside um, and whether it would be something of interest for you to implement in your enforcement procedures. So thank you for listening and we're open to take any questions. Hello there, this is Beverly Simonson. I am reading out the questions on your behalf. So we've got about five minutes of questions. Uh, the first one, can you hear me okay, Jenny? Yes. Yep, so that wasn't the first question, sorry. The first question <laughs> is, um, would you recommend the charge for controlled waste regulations for communal and bulk bin sites? So I guess the question there is because they're communal and you don't know how, who's using them, how could we use enforcement to better control waste from the bulk bin area or communal sites? Excellent. Right. Well, it could be an effective tool. And um, going back to the point that I made about this being a civil remedy, so it's the balance of probability. So I would assume that the communal area is used by a designated um, number of households. And if that was the case, you could 
put a uh, notice out to all of those households. Uh, that's be the section 46 notice specifying what the requirements are. If there continues to be non-compliance, then you would go to the next step of the procedure, which would be to um, issue the written warning and invite written representations. What would be effective here is that because you've got a number of householders uh, uh, being afforded the opportunity to write in with their representations, you would be very quickly able to weed out who is complying and who's not complying. And then hopefully that will narrow down the investigation so you can pinpoint the perpetrator. So yes, in answer to the question, it could be effective, but it, again, you'd have to embark on, on, the, on the route. Um, of the section yeah, that could be yeah, that could be quite resource intensive because um, just thinking of some of the London boroughs where they have many blocks sharing one site, yeah. and you, you can have people wandering in on the estate and dumping it. So I think I assume it would be fit for purpose only in certain situations when you can when, when you're, you're, sh when you're certain, yeah, yes. that only those residents are using those bins. Yeah, um, because if you're levying the charge. Um, you'd be essentially levying it on everybody, so yes. that that wouldn't be effective. Which works in some other countries, like Milan, but we'll, that's a conversation for another time. Here's oh, another no. question. Um, does a Section 46 notice have to be issued before pursuing other enforcement routes, such as CPNs, so that the occupier or landlord is formally informed of their responsibilities that they may be breaching? Yes, so the section 46 notice is a prerequisite to the controlled waste regulations as well as the section 46 procedure. So you do have to have that engagement and it's very much the same for CPNs. The prerequisite is that you've got the CPNW, so you've got the written warning um, to highlight what the issues are and specify what, you, what your requirements are in order to secure compliance and then embark on whatever the appropriate procedure may be thereafter okay. okay um i'm afraid we're gonna have to move on now any unanswered questions we're going to gather up all the questions and we will attempt to answer them and we will post them up on the crwm website so i am going to hand back over to barry okay thanks for that bev and uh thanks to jenny for a, a really interesting and comprehensive presentation i'd like to move on now to the second presentation uh which is by Linda Brown, who's a private sector housing officer at Newham Council. Over to you, Linda. Hello. Hi, my name is Linda Brown. I'm from private sector housing. I'm a private sector housing officer at Newham Council, and I've been working with Newham for 30 years. Um, we have a licensing scheme in force where a landlord who Apply, a license holder who apply for a property license as an additional license, which is for a HMO, the license holder must give the new occupant of the property within seven days of the, the um, tenancy starting as details of how to dispose of waste and recycling. A copy of that information, that letter should be provided to all occupants. Um, and if the council, if, if the council um, sends a demand for documents, that should be provided to the council within 28 days. Um, the landlords also, if they if there's, there's not been a license holder for less than for less than five years, then they must um, be registered as a accredited landlord and course which is chargeable, but at least they'll be, they'll be um, learning how to manage a property properly. The, land, the license holder must also provide the tenants with adequate facilities for disposal of waste, um, refuse and recycling. The license holder shall, shall carry out regular checks and ensure that the common parts, gardens, yard, um, the yard are free from waste the license holder must leave um, old must not leave old furniture bedding refuse or any other rubbish in the immediate um, vicinity of the property um, a license holder must 
um, ensure that any type of waste, um, any type of waste which a council does not routinely collect, such as hazardous material, is disposed of in a safe and lawful manner. The license holder um, become, if the license holder becomes aware that the occupants of or visitors um, are disposing of of rubbish or waste in an appropriate manner, they must take action. Um, and that action can be within um, to you know serve a, give them a letter within seven days to re eradicate any any pests or um, such as cockroaches, rats, mice, vermin, and so on. Any of those documents must be provided to the council within on demand when we um, request any documents from them in line with their license agreement. Next. A question, um, do you think worst effects, um, think worst effects of poor waste management are, choose one of the, the following. Um, it attracts vermin, Rat mice, flies, foxes. It's an eyesore. It's an eyesore gives impression um, impression on the area. Fly attract fly tipping. Is it unhygienic and hazardous to health? Some something else. Um, if you could choose one of those, please. Right, it's come back. Your, it's with, with a reply. It's come back saying that um, forty-four percent um, think it's, it attracts vermin. Fifty-six percent think it's an eyesore. Sixty-seven percent say that it attracts fly to this. Um Fifty-six percent also said that it's unhygienic and is um, and hazardous material. Only three percent. Right, we'll go on to the worst effects of waste, waste um, management. The effects of waste management is that it attracts vermin and foxes. It is an eyesore to the neighbour at the neighbourhood and therefore is a possible, possible fly tipping elsewhere. Inadequate and unhygienic provisions for storing, for storing and disposal of household waste is hazardous. And we sometimes deal with that under the the HHSRS um, domestic hygiene domestic hygiene and refuse. But this is not one of our preferred methods, as it's um, you'd have to serve a notice, um, serve, a, serve a notice, and then that would sort of a to process through the court. Um, the picture on the side there is with the tins is one of a property that we visited um, which um, had rats because those are oil tins from a shop which was uh, on the ground floor. The property was um, above a commercial unit which saw a chicken so of course they used those tins and just disposed of them in the back garden which did attract um, vermin. Next. Um, this um as a result of of um these hazards we can serve financial penalty which is a thing through the civil route which is dealt with at um the property tribunal um what we do is we serve first we serve a notice of intention and give we serve that within two months of witnessing the the offense and give the license holder time to to um respond to that and if they don't then we if they do respond and send in a representation then we reply to their representation fully and turn that within 10 days um they, if they don't then we serve, serve a final final notice and then go on from that um we can also use banning orders which will come in, which hasn't come in as yet, and will come in in April 2018, um, 
for offences for license holders and agencies which have committed offences more than twice. Um, the banning orders can be obtained from the courts and is um, is also or, or also a minimum of 12 months. The banning order can be um, can be given for. Um, as well, the the picture that you're looking at here was from the same garden on the other side, which um, as well had mice and all vermin underneath it, and also they were all, always also in the house as well. Right. Right, the, there's a letter at the back which is in your handout. So if you go to your handout, you can see that letter which was um, done by our recycling team. They had a three strike method, um, which is they would go around, do a, they did a survey, and it was a three strike method. If it would if it happened once, twice, three times, then um, they would get a, fi a financial penalty which would be, as I said, would be dealt with through the civil route as well, which is also a quicker method of going to court and um, um, waiting for an owner, you know, a long, lengthy method of um, going through the courts to, to get a result. Is there any questions? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Linda. This is Beverly back again. So we have a question yeah. here. Um, yeah. How would you advise tracking down rogue landlords? I know in London, um, a lot of the London boroughs have an issue with the fact that landlords live overseas or are very hard to track down. Um, and if they want to control the waste through the landlords, how would you advise trying to get hold of them? Right. Well, once we go out on um, go out on and witness an offence. Um, as long as it's a criminal offence that we've witnessed, we, we come back and we can use um, NAFIN. I don't know if any one of you are aware of NAFIN, National Anti-Fraud Network. Um, we can put their name in there, which tracks them down. It's a credit reference. So um, it can only be used where a criminal offence has been witnessed. Um, so once you put their name in there, any credit that they've got that will Prove, show, show up any addresses that they've had electoral, um, the electoral register where they are, um, if they've had any credit at any other location, it um, also pinpoint where you can find them. And that way we do locate, 90% 90, 90 of the time we do locate the, the license holders, the um, landlords. And because we've got um, the properties are licensed, then that's a, a duty um, that the license holder has to make sure that it, um, they comply. Okay, thank you. And um, are you, finally, are you finding it effective as a way to control waste by using the um, going through the landlords and using the you know via housing in the method you're doing? Mm -hmm. Have you been in touch with the the waste team? Have they said it's quite effective in reducing waste? It is because we work. Um, we do. We do work in. We don't work in silo. We work across the board with other agencies, internal and external. Mm -hmm. So, um, if there's any, if we go out there or any of the other services witness any any um, fly tipping or or rubbish or waste in front gardens or rear gardens, then that's reported back to us, and then we go out. So we do work in conjunction with other team. Great, thank you for that, thank you for your time. I'm going to hand back over to Barry now, thank you. Okay, thanks for that Bev and thanks to Linda as well for a very interesting um, presentation. I'd like to move on now to the final presentation of this webinar and that is by uh, Katharina Pack who's a Waste and Street Services Manager for Ealing Council. Over to you Katharina. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I hope you can. I've just switched back on. So I think first of all, we have a poll question. A question for the audience. So that should hopefully be coming up now. 
do you agree that landlords should be responsible for waste management at their properties? So yes, no, or partially? Excellent. So a similar reaction to myself. So I think I believe that the infrastructure, the provision uh, should be the landlord responsibility, but it is also down to the individual behaviour and the tenant responsibility. So we'll explore that a little bit more uh, throughout the presentation. So I'll be talking about improving waste management from rented properties, a collaborative approach. So Ealing, uh, for those of you who are not uh, London uh, residents, <laughs> is a West London borough in outer London, the third largest borough in London, with affluent areas alongside areas of deprivation. It has the third most ethnically diverse local population in the UK. Black and minority ethnic communities make up around 53% of Ealing's total population. We have 36,000 properties in the private rental sector in Ealing. Out of approximately 130,000 properties, so it's a fairly significant proportion. Regulatory services have introduced Ealing's private rented property licensing schemes, making Ealing a better place to rent, and this was launched about a year ago. So we have additional HMO licensing, and this is borough wide, where all HMO properties must be licensed in addition to the mandatory HMO licensing that there is. We also have selective licensing where all privately rented properties in five out of 23 wards must be licensed. These wards were selected because they have high numbers of privately rented homes in poor condition and there are significant problems uh, with antisocial behaviour or waste management, etc. Licence holders have to comply with several conditions relating to the management and condition of the property, including gas, electrical, fire, safety and the facilities provided. There are three license conditions related to waste management. So the provision of bins for waste and recycling, both externally and internally, and the provision of information, a notice or a copy of information on collection arrangements and days for tenants. Generic service information is provided to landlords on how to order bins or report missed collections. So far, over 6,000 applications have been received and just under 3,000 have been processed and issued. We have two main objectives at the moment surrounding licensing and behaviour change and a wider behaviour change campaign that encompasses a number of different stakeholders. So we're looking to maximise the potential impact of the new licensing scheme in influencing how landlords and tenants manage their waste, but we've also this wider objective to change residents, landlords, managing agents and businesses' behaviours and attitudes towards the environment, so including fly tipping, street litter and recycling to achieve a cleaner borough. We've made use of the Resource London guidance, um, improving waste management in the domestic rented sector, sorry, though we do have more to do. So we're looking at, at the moment, the educating and encouraging the right behaviours. We're gathering local intelligence from council officers, councillors. We also have contractor information in cab reporting of side waste, excess waste, or contamination of recycling. This helps us to plan where we need to target our efforts. We're looking at communication and the provision of information. As I mentioned, a condition of the licenses for landlords to ensure that information on waste management is provided to tenants. We have generic comms at the moment with specific interventions I'll come on to. We've attended landlord forums. We need to do this more. It's a good event to, to do. And in terms of collaboration, we're working with planning colleagues, ensuring there are storage areas for waste containment and calculating the appropriate number of bins for properties, both, both flats and houses in multiple occupation. We have good links with the regulatory services licensing team, flagging and troubleshooting issues for each other. And we're working with the enforcement team who can provide intel, engage with landlords and potentially enforce. So this is just an example of some of our generic comms on waste and recycling collections, how to use bins, and we're working on more targeted and specific comms. 
We have calendars available online, which landlords can download and make available to their tenants. And now I'll show you a couple of specific interventions that have come about through intervention sharing. So facilitating physical changes to property frontages by landlords to enable appropriate storage of wheelie bins and waste containment. A much better option here than using black sacks that can be ripped open or open green boxes with wind blown items or indeed bins on pavements causing an obstruction. So we've got the before picture there with an overgrown garden, a wall with no space for storage for bins and the after picture where we do have space for waste containment, much better waste management solution including the recycling and a more visually, visually acceptable solution. Similarly, liaison with managing agents in this rental property, uh, complaints and problems with waste storage here. And following this, we made waste containment improvements and actually then were able to provide uh, recycling facilities following that intervention. So for us, next steps in terms of communications, we're developing additional information uh, alongside the license that's more specific to the generic comms that we currently have. We're adding downloadable information to the website in addition to the calendar, including information leaflets and what can go in the recycling bins. We're looking into reminder information uh, to the license holder during the period of the license, which runs for five years potentially making use of an electronic analytics tool, determining if emails and documents um, are opened, which would be quite useful. We're mapping fly tipping hotspots to help in targeting messaging to both residents and landlords in problem areas. We're looking at engaging with estate agents regarding waste management and end of tenancy arrangements, particularly around bulky waste. We want to focus on bulky waste and what to do with it. It's often left in front gardens or on the public highway and can be difficult to enforce against. So this next slide is an example of our bulky waste uh, comms. Um, it's quite generic. Um, we're carrying out some focus groups in areas with high levels of fly tipping, including bulky waste, to try to determine what the causes are. This will help to tailor our future communications. And our next steps in terms of enforcement. Um, we do carry out enforcement of fly tipping. We actively search for evidence using a dedicated fly tip uh, enforcement sort of team. Um, it's not directly related obviously to HMOs and rental properties but as a wider enforcement tool and, and it often is caused by those uh, properties. Um, we do uh, educate people by sending generic letters to the landlords and the occupants. We have used the CPW and the CPN um, for major dumping, uh, for example, of many bulky items in a front garden. And really our enforcement approach is, is to be developed further. Um, you know, it's been particularly interesting today uh, regarding the controlled waste regulations. And we'll also look at what we might do with Airbnb properties and whether we levy a charge for additional waste produced. So in conclusion, we've gone some way to improving waste management from rental properties in Ealing. And with the ongoing collaborative approach across the council can make further improvements by engaging with landlords and agents and developing our enforcement approach. So thanks for listening and if you've got any questions. Hi Kat, thank you for that. Um, back on. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. I'm just checking how long we have for questions and I'm wrapping up. So one question is, um, did Ealing Council pay for the improvements to the waste storage area? In those examples that I've given today, no, we didn't. Um, obviously, we're, we're working on examples that, that we come across um, case by case basis. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we have funding to pay for it and I would uh, hopefully expect the landlord or housing association or managing agent to make those alterations. Um, I'm sure we may have some arguments in the future though. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Um, it's an incre interesting question here. Have you c ever considered waiving the bulky waste charges at peak periods? So, for example, at end of student tenancies or in problem areas? And do you think that would make a difference? It's not something we've looked at, but it's something that is probably worth thinking about. Um, potentially also with household waste recycling sites and a provision or a discount for landlords or something like that. And these are things that I think we do need to look at next. Yes. Yeah.
And um, actually a question from me. Um, have you been working just with um, landlords on curbside properties? where arguably it's slightly easier to then control the waste and have or ha have you come across any with flats like how would you control this? I mean one of the examples um there just one of the pictures was that was a, a small block of flats I, I don't remember the exact number of properties um and that was a managing agent rather than a, a landlord um so not specifically but as I say it's as things come to our attention we're, we're working through them um with the team okay thank you um another one here um what information is captured by the inca technology and how is that drawn out to flag up problem properties so it, it would capture uh, bins not presented it also captures um excess waste so side waste uh, or additional bins at a property um or contamination of the recycling and we can we can get that real time if we log on to the system uh, that our contractor uses or we get it sent um, weekly really we look at it um, we get that sent across from our contractor and we can see if there's repeat problems on there or repeat properties and we use that then to either send out generic letters um, or actually potentially go and, and do some visits uh, staff dependent okay yeah um, and one final quick question uh, before I hand back to Barry, um, slightly unrelated, uh, what is your current volume for of waste calculation for flats? So the recycling waste. Do you have a generic rule of thumb for uh, developers, or do you mean? Sorry, I th uh, I it's saying the current volume of waste. So uh, calculation. So for curbside, you give them two wheelie bins. Um, per property. Yes, and I would need to check. We do have we have a formula that we use that's within our planning guidelines. So I'm happy to um, share that. Yeah, make that available. Yeah. Okay. Um, it looks like another question. One more question. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, have, you, have you used? We've just got time. Have you used the management of houses in multiple occupation additional provisions for England regulations? Section oh, 2007, Section 8, number four. I'm afraid I don't know what that is off the top of my head. I would need to check because that would be a bit yeah. of the detail that the regulatory services team would have, but uh, equally I can I can find that out also. I, yeah, I am aware that some other local authorities, so in the RAP guidance, the FLATS guidance, there's a case study in there that Preston City Council used to use the HMO regulations to control waste from, but that's only from HMOs, whereas a lot of these rental properties not necessarily registered as HMOs so um, yeah they're only for specific properties so I'm going to hand over thank you so much Kat I'm going to hand over thank back to Barry to wrap up okay thanks for that Beverly and also um, thanks to uh, Katharina for another uh, very interesting presentation hopefully uh, everybody on the line has found today's been useful and um, learnt something from it. The slide that you've got up now uh, is uh, showing all the presenters, um, Jenny, Linda and uh, Katharina, together with their email addresses. So if you do want to contact them, um, you're, you're able to do that. I'd just like to um, say thank you to, to all the presenters for those really comprehensive and, and interesting presentations. And also thanks to everybody on the line for, um, for dialing in. Uh, as I said right at the beginning, uh, at the end of the webinar, there will be a very brief multiple choice survey that will pop up for you. And if you could take a, a couple of minutes to answer that, that would be great because we, we'd like to see your feedback and uh, look at how we can improve things for the, for the future. So um, really, I think that's, that brings us pretty well to the end of this uh, webinar, which has been waste from rented households and the law and has been jointly presented to you by uh, the law and Southern Counties and the Northwest Centres of the Chartered Institute of Waste Management. So with that, I will say thank you very much for listening and wish you all